Hey everybody, and welcome back to History Student Reacts. Today we will be watching Napoleon Endgame France 1814 by Epic History TV. So this is the second to last video in Epic History TV's Napoleonic Wars series. Uh, the only one we've got left after this is Waterloo. And then of course we've got the uh, Napoleon's Marshals videos, which I will be watching. So in the last video we saw Napoleon's defeat at Leipzig. And we can kind of see that uh, everything's sort of coming to an end. But I'm sort of curious to see how Napoleon goes out. Because obviously I know generally how this whole thing ends, but I don't know the details. So I'm very excited to get into this video, see how everything comes together. Uh, I hope you guys are excited, so let's just jump right into it. Right. So, I mean, this whole time we talked about how Napoleon really doesn't want to give up any concessions. And in the last video, we actually saw for one of the first times Napoleon was offering concessions to his enemies. Um, they wouldn't take his offer because they knew they had the upper hand. But for the first time, Napoleon's realizing that, you know, if he wants to make it out of this, if he wants to, you know, maintain what he's gained, he's going to have to give some stuff up. And as you can see here in this quote, <clears throat> he's sort of wrestling with this, you know? It's easy enough to, you know, say peace, it's easy enough to ask for peace, but to actually give up what he's gained, that is much, much harder. And it always has been for him. <clears throat> in October 1813, Napoleon had suffered his heaviest ever defeat at Leipzig. Yeah. The Battle of the Nations. Surviving French forces, exhausted, sick and demoralised, retreated to the River Rhine and prepared to defend France from invasion. I mean, and this is the worst point uh, that we've really seen Napoleon at. <clears throat> a bunch of his, as you can see in this map, a bunch of his troops are trapped throughout Europe. He can't go back to rescue them. Uh, he suffered this defeat at Leipzig. He's got uh, British, Portuguese, uh, and I believe Spanish forces pressing in on uh, the Pyrenees, you know, the western border of France. And as you can see, we have uh, enemies now closing in, uh, you know, closer to France's territory than they've been in years. So this is really uh, a low point for Napoleon. <clears throat> but in November... The armies of the Sixth Coalition paused their advance, and Austrian Foreign Minister Metternich offered peace terms. Mm. The Frankfurt proposals would allow Napoleon to keep his throne if France returned to her so-called natural frontiers. Hmm. It was the best offer Napoleon was likely to get. Now, Yes, yeah, it really was. He would not get another... Uh, offer and frankly uh, another offer this good um, and the idea of France extending to her natural frontiers or her natural borders you know if you told this to the French government in say <clears throat> 1794 or 1793 yeah your uh, European enemies are going to offer you a deal that will let you keep this amount of territory they would have been amazed they would have been like uh, yeah of course we'll take that deal I mean this is a level of expansion that uh they never could have imagined the rest of Europe agreeing to. Um, of course, at this point, this already is still a, a downgrade for Napoleon, you know, considering his domination of Europe. So it really shows how sort of far we've come. ...that his back was to the wall, and all Europe's great powers were united against him. Even so, he did not accept the terms he merely agreed to reopen negotiations. To the Allies, and many in France itself, it proved that Napoleon would not listen to reason. Hmm. The war went on, and by January 1814, Napoleon's situation looked even worse. Many of his besieged garrisons in the east were starved into surrender. Marshal Davout, with 34,000 men in Hamburg, was now besieged. Denmark, one of France's last allies, was invaded by Bernadotte's Swedish army, 
and made to join the coalition. French troops evacuated the Netherlands, which reasserted its independence after nearly 20 years of French control. Yeah, so there's kind of like an air of inevitability to this that you start feeling and, you know, has been, I've been sort of feeling for a while, you know, not only has Napoleon been surrounded and pushed back, forced to retreat, but now, you know, his remaining allies are turning against him or being forced to turn against him, territory that France has occupied for 20 years. Think about that. I mean, that is a lengthy period of time. Um, you know, in a single person's life, 20 years, that, that, that's a long time. Um, territory that France has held for that amount of time is being uh, retaken. So it really is uh, all closing in on Napoleon and on France. Um, and it has been closing in for a while at this point. I mean, particularly since the failed campaign in Russia. <clears throat> in Italy, Eugène's army faced a new enemy. Joachim Murat, king ah. of Naples, now marching north with 30,000 men. To and of course, we can see guys like Murat and Bernadotte, who once fought alongside Napoleon, now fight against him. So that's another sort of uh, interesting note in everything closing in on Napoleon. Honor his new alliance with the Sixth Coalition. In Paris, Napoleon responded to the crisis with a series of extreme measures. Property taxes doubled, state salaries and pensions suspended, 300,000 new conscripts called up from a country already exhausted by 20 years of war. Yeah, I, you know, I don't know too much, to be honest, about Napoleon's domestic policy. Um, I mean, obviously, Napoleon was extremely popular at times due to his vast successes. But now that France has been at war for 20 years, um, and they're losing pretty badly, you know, everything's going wrong, and now Napoleon imposes these sort of harsh domestic policies, uh, you know, I can't imagine that would have been popular. I know Napoleon maintained a lot of support until the end, but in that moment, I, I feel like a lot of the French public would not have been too pleased um, with these increased burdens on them. Um, though, like I said, I don't know much about sort of Napoleon's domestic situation, so I'd be curious to sort of uh, see. <clears throat> he ordered the release of Pope Pius under <clears throat> French house arrest for the last five years to try to shore up his support in Italy. <clears throat> he even agreed to release Fernando, the Bourbon King of Spain, to take up his throne in exchange for peace between France and Spain a condition that Fernando was in no position to honor. Hmm. But these concessions were too little, far too late. And that's how it always goes. You know, you have someone in a lot of power who doesn't want to give anything up. And by the time they get to the point where they're willing to give concessions, it's not enough. Um, and yeah, this is particularly true for Napoleon. Like I said, we... We saw him offering serious concessions for one of the first times in the last episode with the Battle of Leipzig, uh, and he's continuing to, at this point, give out concessions, but now it's just not enough, you know? Uh, you know, his enemies are going to crush him. They want to crush France, um, and not destroy it necessarily, but seriously reduce its power, past a point that Napoleon would agree to. In January... <clears throat> two coalition armies crossed the Rhine into France. Blücher's army of Silesia and Schwarzenberg's army of Bohemia. Mm. Outnumbered French forces in their path could only fall back. On the 25th of January, Napoleon said farewell to his wife and son at the Tuileries Palace before leaving for the front. Wow. He would never see either of them again. With just 70,000 men, he faced odds of four to one. Most of his troops were raw conscripts, some without uniforms, many just learning how to hold a musket. Jeez. I mean, this has been another prominent theme throughout the series. You know, early on, one of the main things in Napoleon's advantage, apart from, you know, his personal talents, 
was the training, the discipline, and the morale of the Grand Armée, uh, Napoleon's force. Um, you know, it was a very well-disciplined force. It was well-supplied. <clears throat> it had very high morale. Um, but for a while now, you know, Napoleon's been fighting for years, and of course, you know, his troops keep dying, and so he keeps needing to get more new conscripts. Particularly following the campaign in Russia, he lost an insane number of men, and he had to build a new army almost from scratch. Um, and so these new armies that he's building, they just don't have the same level of training, they're not supplied as well, they certainly don't have the same level of morale and unity. No, it's just not the same as it was 10 years ago. But for the first time in years, <clears throat> Napoleon's army was so small that he'd be able to exercise direct command over all its movements. Wow. The result would be one of the most audacious and brilliant campaigns in history. Okay, I'm excited to Imagine see. Imagine Napoleon waging war in the 20th century. Imagine. All right, so shout out to Epic History TV and, uh, you know, His cavalry shout out to their sponsor. Uh, you know, go check out their video. It's linked down below. Uh, and go check out their sponsor and show some love to them. We want to show love and respect to the original creator for the fantastic content. I mean, this whole series has been uh, extremely well done, very impressive. I've enjoyed it a lot. And we're almost done. So yeah, please go show them some love, guys. Wow. Xbox and his cross to join War Thunder for sponsoring this video. All right, there we go. So go check that out. <laughs> okay, you still got that confidence. Uh, I am really interested to see how this goes. The battle for France would be fought east of Paris, mostly across Champagne a flat region divided by the rivers Marne and Seine and mm. their tributaries. In late January, fields were dusted with snow and roads quickly turned to mud. Napoleon learned that the coalition armies were widely scattered, with part of Blücher's army near Napoleon's old college at Brienne. The emperor advanced rapidly, hoping to trap and destroy part of Blücher's army. But after a hard day's fighting that cost both sides 3,000 casualties, Blücher was able to retreat towards Schwarzenberg's army. Mm. That evening, Napoleon was nearly skewered by a charging Cossack, saved only by General Gorgo's good shooting. Wow. Lucky. <laughs> As Napoleon tried to work out the enemy's movements, Blücher, heavily reinforced by Schwarzenberg, made a surprise attack at La Rothière. Allied troops advanced through swirling snow to assault the village, defiantly held by young French conscripts. I will say, you know, we talked about how, you know, the Grand Armée isn't what it once was, and we've seen Napoleon make some mistakes um, throughout the years, particularly in, uh, you know, recent years, you know. Um, you know, close to 1814, 1813, 1812. Another thing that's changed, you know, it's not just the French that have changed, it's the rest of Europe. I mean, the rest, the other armies of Europe have taken a lot of notes from Napoleon, how he organized his army, how he led them, how he disciplined them. And so the enemies Napoleon is fighting now are far more formidable than the enemies he fought 10 years ago. You know, they're better trained, uh, they're using modern Napoleonic military tactics. Um, you know, the armies are organized differently. And so it's not just him that's changed. You know, it's the rest of Europe. Um, so that's also pretty important to note. One was so inexperienced that Marshal Marmont had to personally show him how to load his musket during the battle. Wow. By late afternoon, Vreda's Bavarian Corps was falling on Napoleon's flank. Heavily outnumbered, Napoleon had no option but to retreat, having lost 5,000 casualties and 
with 73 guns abandoned in the thick mud. Oh, yikes. The Allies' frontal attacks meant their losses were greater. But by combining their armies, they defeated Napoleon on French soil for the first time. Yeah, I mean, so far it is not going super well for Napoleon. I mean, he has taken some decisive action, but he has suffered a defeat on his own territory. So it's looking bad so far, but let's see how it goes. Believing Napoleon would now retreat towards Paris, the Allies decided to advance along two routes to ease pressure on the roads. Blücher would take a northern route along the Marne. Schwarzenberg would follow the Seine. Okay. I mean, I understand, but uh, separating, separating them does definitely give Napoleon a chance to strike. Um, you know, their biggest advantage over him is their advantage in numbers. So this could provide an opportunity for Napoleon. But dividing their armies again <clears throat> would play right into Napoleon's ah, hands. Exactly. <laughs> Hmm. Okay, interesting. After two days to reorganize, Napoleon continued his retreat to Nogent, where he learned that the Allies had split their armies. Not only that, they were advancing at different speeds. The aggressive Blücher racing ahead, while the more cautious Schwarzenberg lagged behind. Uh-oh leaving Oudinot and Victor to guard the Seine bridges and delay Schwarzenberg, Napoleon raced north through mud and rain with 30,000 men. The army of Silesia was strung out on the march, oblivious to the danger it was in. Oh, that's just bad preparation. I mean, Napoleon is still outnumbered by Blücher's force alone, um, but they're so separated uh, strung out that, you know, he may get the upper hand here. First, Napoleon fell on General Osufiev's Russian 9th Corps at Champaubert, destroying it, taking its commander and 2,000 men prisoner. The next morning, he marched on General Austin Sacken's force near Montmiral. This was a much larger force with two infantry and one cavalry corps and was mm. expecting support from York's Prussian First Corps. But the Prussians were late, and Sacken's troops could not withstand the French onslaught. At this desperate hour, the Emperor's elite Old Guard were no longer held back, but were often thrown into the thick of the fighting. Wow. By the end of the day, Napoleon had inflicted another 3,500 casualties, twice his own losses the Allies were in rapid retreat. Napoleon had ordered Marshal Macdonald to cut off the enemy's escape by seizing the Marne Bridge at Chateau Thierry. But York's Prussians got there first. The next day, Napoleon could only batter their rear guard as the enemy fled across the Marne, destroying the bridge behind them. Sending Marshal Mortier to rebuild the bridge and continue the pursuit Napoleon doubled back to rejoin Marmont, who had been left to keep watch on Blücher. Napoleon attacked at Vauchamp, using General Grouchy's cavalry to outflank Blücher's army, which was soon in headlong retreat. A merciless French pursuit inflicted 6,000 Prussian and Russian casualties. Wow. Napoleon lost just 600 men. Yeah, I mean, you can definitely see the brilliance of Napoleon in these actions. Um, and if he wants to win, he's, he'll have to keep this up. This is not enough. Um, but a great start. You know, he is vastly outnumbered <clears throat> by his enemies, yet he's able to split them apart or take advantage of them splitting themselves apart um, in order to gain an advantage battle by battle. Uh, and defeat them uh, separately. So, I mean, this is very impressive so far. Napoleon had taken on an enemy army almost twice his size and beaten it four times in just six days. Wow. Blücher had lost an estimated 15,000 casualties in battle, 
and another 15,000 in smaller engagements. Oh my goodness. Stragglers or desert. Okay, so this is exactly what he needs to do. This is what Napoleon needs to do if he wants to win. You know, sometimes you'll have a smaller army fighting a larger one, and the smaller army will gain victories, but they will lose uh, an unacceptable number of men. Um, you know, there's a term called Pyrrhic victory, which is where you win a battle, but basically the losses that you endure kind of negate the victory. Napoleon is not doing that here. Not only is he beating Blucher, but he is inflicting far more casualties than he's suffering. Uh, ten times more, roughly. So if he can keep this up, then he could still pull out a victory. Uh, I mean, we know he doesn't in the end, but this is extremely impressive. For now, the army of Silesia had been scattered and neutralized. But in the south, Marshals Victor and Udino had not been able to prevent Schwarzenberg's army of Bohemia from crossing the Seine in three places. Mm. Austrian troops were now just 40 miles from Paris. Leaving Mortier and Marmont to keep watch on Blücher, Napoleon raced south. Schwarzenberg, alarmed by news of Blücher's defeat and of Napoleon's approach, immediately ordered a retreat. It was too late for Wittgenstein's advance guard, routed at Mormain with 2,000 casualties. Napoleon sent Victor's second corps to seize the bridge at Montereau, but was so infuriated by its slow progress that he sacked Victor and gave his corps to General Gérard. <laughs> the next day at the Battle of Montereau, the French drove the Allied Württemberg Corps back across the river, with 30% losses. Wow. According to some accounts, the Emperor sighted the French cannon himself, as he had at Lodi 18 years before. Jeez. Napoleon had the Allies on the run. But how long could it last? That's exactly the question. I mean, right now, these are some resounding victories for Napoleon, but it's only been a few days, you know? If he can keep this up, then he could win. But, you know, this takes a tremendous amount of intelligence, effort, brilliance to keep going consistently. You know, eventually, you might falter, or something might go wrong that's out of your control. Um, if he can keep it up, he might have... Uh, that victory at the end of the day. Even if he does, France is still in a bad position. But can he keep it up? That's the question. Hmm. Yeah. And that that's kind of the point I, I was getting at. Um, you know, the British Foreign Secretary is saying, you know, hey, remember our position. How exactly is France going to de resist um, 600,000 warriors, he calls them, soldiers? And he makes a good point. Even if Napoleon pulls out a bunch of brilliant victories, at the end of the day, he's so vastly outnumbered that, you know... If the coalition just pulls back, regroups, and advances together, I'm not sure he has much of a chance at the end of the day. So, you know, he's kind of in a position where it, his defeat sort of seems inevitable, even if he can pull out some brilliant victories in the short term. Even as fighting continued, negotiations between France and the coalition reopened at Châtillon-sur-Seine on the 5th of February. I mean, his best option is to win a series of impressive victories and then parlay those into a piece that's more favorable to France's interests. Now, he was already uh, offered a deal, you know, to uh, keep territory that extends to France's natural frontiers that was, uh, in retrospect, a pretty attractive deal to accept. But, you know, now he has to see if he can, you know, bargain with the coalition and use his victories to secure a better peace deal than what he would get otherwise. 
the Allied terms were now more severe. Right. A return to France's frontiers of 1791, which meant wow. the additional loss of Belgium, a humiliation that Napoleon refused to accept. Instead, he tried to revive the Frankfurt proposals, hoping to play for time and to split the coalition, whose war aims varied from Britain's hard line to Austria's more ambiguous position. Yeah, I mean, that is, I mean, those terms were a lot stricter than what they had offered before. Back to 1791, remember guys, the French Revolution was 1789. So we're going back to a long, long time ago. Um, whereas, as I had mentioned, um, the, the deal regarding France's natural frontiers, that would have been, you know, pretty impressive to France back in the 1790s. Um, that was a much more attractive deal. <clears throat> but this hope was thwarted by British Foreign Secretary Lord Castlereagh. On the 1st of March, he persuaded the Allies to sign the Treaty of Chaumont. In it, Russia, Prussia, Austria and Great Britain agreed to keep 150,000 troops in the field and not to negotiate separately with France while Britain added the sweetener of a £5 million subsidy to be shared among the Allies. Yeah, the tricky Brits and their money. Uh, that, you know, they can grease a lot of palms, get a lot of stuff done uh, with their navy and their wealth, as we've seen throughout this conflict. The treaty's secret articles <laughs> specified common war aims, including the future independence of the German states, Switzerland mm. and Italy, while Spain was to be returned to the Bourbons, and Holland to the House of Orange. The four powers even agreed that once they'd defeated Napoleon, they'd form a 20-year defensive alliance to maintain peace in Europe, a sign of their newfound commitment to each other. Hmm. A split in the coalition had been Napoleon's last best hope for a favorable peace. That was gone and news from across the country was bleak. Fr and I mean, there would be, you know, arguments among the coalition, debates, some like minor splits, uh, and I mean, some pretty serious diplomatic conflicts between them, but largely they would collaborate to secure peace in Europe and, uh, you know, reorder the geopolitics of Europe. So, you know, they... they I don't know necessarily if they held true to the specific provisions of this deal, but they held true to the general idea, which was that they were going to collaborate to restore the balance of power within Europe. French cities were surrendering to the Allies without a fight. Nancy, Dijon and Macon had all fallen. Wow. In the south, Wellington defeated Marshal Soult at Ortez forcing him to fall back on Toulouse. Two weeks later, as British troops approached the city of Bordeaux, it declared loyalty to France's Bourbon kings. Hmm. The mayor himself rode out to greet the British, bearing a white cockade, the sign of Bourbon allegiance. Wow, and so, you know, we're kind of uh, getting a bit of a throwback to 20 years prior, when, you know, there was some serious counter-revolutionary movements in France in the 1790s, and we saw rebellions spring up, um, and, you know, we saw some of the rebellions allying with, for example, the British um, against the revolution, uh, you know, and for the monarchy. But we haven't seen stuff like that in literal decades in France. So the fact that that's springing up again should sort of show you what position uh, France is in at this point. I mean, it's in the worst position than it has been throughout the whole revolution, probably. In terms of foreign incursions on its territory, sure. Um, you know, they had a lot of rebellions in the 1790s, and uh, there was a lot of rebel-held territory, but never has revolutionary France experienced foreign armies so deep into its own countryside. So it's really uh, the government, which is basically Napoleon, is in quite a desperate position. 
Napoleon's hope for a nation in arms to resist the Allies had not materialised. No. Nope. Allied troops, particularly Cossacks, often robbed French civilians and committed some atrocities. Mm. French peasants took revenge when they could. But there was no guerrilla war to mirror what French troops had encountered in Spain or Russia. The chief desire among ordinary French people was for peace. France has been fighting for a long time, more than 20 years. Um, not to mention, like I said, there's been rebellions, you know, civil war, if you could call it that. Um, you know, fighting, domestic fighting within France, pro-revolution, anti-revolution, you know, you know. They've had, you know, sort of a form of total warfare going for a while, lots of conscription. You know, you can kind of understand that at this point, everybody's probably pretty exhausted of fighting, of warfare. Um, you know, and you know, when you're getting those brilliant victories under Napoleon, um, you know, that's uh, definitely a morale booster. But when you've been fighting for more than 20 years and now you're losing and your home's being invaded, you might just want to give up at that point. At almost any price. Hmm. Interesting. Any talk of Napoleon's defeat in late February was premature. The French Emperor was driving Schwarzenberg's army of Bohemia before him, even though it was twice his size. But Schwarzenberg scrambled to safety behind the River Ob. Hmm. Napoleon knew he had to land another decisive blow soon, so turned his attention back to Blücher. After an aborted attempt to join forces with Schwarzenberg, Blücher had decided to resume his advance on Paris, gathering reinforcements en route, and with only Marmont and Mortier's weak corps to oppose him. Leaving Marshal Macdonald in command in the south, Napoleon set off to intercept Blücher, covering 60 miles in three days along terrible roads choked with mud. At Napoleon's approach, Blücher retreated across the Marne, burning the bridges behind him. 24 hours later, they'd been rebuilt by French engineers, and Napoleon was poised to crush Blücher against the Erne River, because the major crossing point at Soissons was held by a Franco-Polish garrison. Mm. But after just a day's fighting, the garrison commander at Soissons tamely surrendered, allowing Blücher to escape. I mean, I don't know exactly how this is going to go, but that seems like it could be a pretty major uh, what-if scenario. Uh, you know, what if... Uh, the Franco-Polish force had held that town and not allowed Blucher to cross what could have happened. Um, I don't know. But then again, I also don't know what is going to happen. <laughs> Napoleon continued his pursuit across the Aisne, still hoping to cut off the army of Silesia. But at Craon, he encountered Russian troops in a strong defensive position. Mm. The Russians fought stubbornly. The French finally forced the enemy to withdraw, but only at the cost of 6,000 casualties, including many irreplaceable veterans from Napoleon's guard. Yikes. Yeah, I mean, Napoleon is being forced to utilize his old guard frequently, which you know, as we saw in the campaign in Russia, was something he did not uh, want to do. Um, you know, even in desperate situations, he would withhold them um, because he knew they were so important to the his army. You know, they were the core of his army. But he has no choice in these situations, you know. He is desperate, and he has to win or else. You know, he's got to do what he's got to do. Napoleon pushed on. To long. But by now, Blücher had concentrated his forces, 98,000 troops in all, 
mm. and outnumbered Napoleon two to one. I mean, Blucher used the classic coalition strategy of avoid Napoleon until you've uh, found a better position or gathered enough troops to greatly outnumber him. You know, they knew not to fight Napoleon unless they had a great advantage over him. Uh, because otherwise, he would readily defeat you. And even if you had that better position or that great numerical advantage, he would still challenge you severely and potentially beat you. French attacks were repulsed, while Marmont's corps was caught off guard by a late Allied counterattack and routed. Mm. Napoleon was lucky to avoid a much heavier defeat. Blücher, usually aggressive to the point of recklessness, was mm. unwell and had been told Napoleon's army was twice as big as it was, leading him to act with unusual caution. Mm. Long was a heavy blow to Napoleon. Six and a half thousand casualties he could not afford. Yeah. Undaunted, he fell back to Soissons. And after a brief moment to reorganize, he marched on the city of Reims, which had just fallen to Saint-Priest's Russian corps. I mean, that's Napoleon. That man will not stop. We were talking about earlier in the video how you know, he has to sort of keep this momentum going, or it could all fall apart. Um, I mean, he just lost momentum there with that, uh, with losing those forces he can't afford to lose. And yet, you know, that doesn't stop Napoleon. He'll keep going. He'll keep going until he can't. Um, so that, that, that's pretty typical for him. In a whirlwind assault, Napoleon retook the city. Saint-Priest himself was mortally wounded, his corps routed. Hmm. Meanwhile, in the south, Schwarzenberg had resumed his offensive as soon as he found out Napoleon had gone north. In heavy fighting, he'd driven Oudinot and Macdonald back from the River Ope. Five days later, the Allies had recaptured Troyes as MacDonald retreated behind the River Seine. Now, after four days to rest and reorganize his battered army, Napoleon was coming south once more. Hmm. Schwarzenberg, emboldened by news of Napoleon's defeat at Laon, decided that this time he would stand and fight. Okay then. Napoleon advanced on Arcisse sur Eub. Schwarzenberg is usually more cautious, so I'm interested to see how this goes. Ignoring reports that the enemy was not retreating, as he believed, but <clears throat> gathering for battle. As heavy fighting broke out, Napoleon still believed he faced only the enemy rearguard. Uh -oh. It was a nasty surprise to discover that he faced the entire might of the army of Bohemia. 28,000 men against 80,000. In desperate fighting, Napoleon personally rallied fleeing troops and exposed himself to enemy fire, having his horse killed under him by an exploding shell. But the odds were too great. At the end of the second day, Napoleon was forced to order the retreat. I mean, you know, Napoleon's decisiveness and his quick action is what you know, made him successful in many ways, but we've also seen that it can hurt him at times. Um, when he doesn't have correct intel, you know, he doesn't have accurate information, and he, you know, rushes into a situation decisively, um, you know, he can end up finding out, oh wait, I'm actually in a very bad position, and then, you know, he ends up losing. And um, it was interesting to see that now Napoleon himself is right out there on the battlefield, he's getting involved, which... On one hand, I mean, he's using his greatest talents. You know, he was a leader of men. You know, he could inspire people. Um, he just had that personal charisma that really inspired those around him. At the same time, this shows you how desperate it's gotten because he's putting himself in harm's way to get um, 
I mean, honestly, just to keep his forces afloat. So he's in a desperate, desperate position. <clears throat> It also makes me think that Napoleon has both the qualities of a great uh, tactician, strategist, general, uh, and also the qualities of a great leader. Because these are not always, um, you know, together. Sometimes they are exclusive. Um, you know, I think George Washington's a good example of someone who was a great inspirational leader, wasn't necessarily a great general. Um, he wasn't terrible. I mean, he was a good general, but he wasn't one of the best. The greatest qualities of George Washington were how he was able to inspire his men, his charisma. You know, he was able to lead people. Um, Napoleon has both of those. You know, he has that personal charisma. And then he also has, you know, the genius, the brilliance, uh, you know, in tactics and strategy. So, I mean, that is... Part of what makes him such a great figure is that he has all of those things. <clears throat> Napoleon believed his army was now too weak to take on the Allies directly. Mm. So he decided to change strategy. He would march into the rear of the Allied armies, join up with some of his isolated garrisons, and cut the enemy's lines of communication forcing them to abandon their advance on Paris. But the Allies, until now always one step behind Napoleon, had just received crucial information. Ooh. Talleyrand, the most brilliant French diplomat of the age, and the most slippery. Oh, yes. It served France's monarchy, the Revolution, then Napoleon, until in 1807, and he would serve the next regime. He fell out irrevocably with the Emperor over foreign policy. He now believed that Napoleon was dragging France into ruin and worked behind the scenes to ensure his downfall. Yes, yeah, so I've talked a bit about Talleyrand on this channel before. Um, I reacted to a video on him. Um, I reacted to, uh, in Historia Civilis' Congress of Vienna videos, we talked a bit about Talleyrand. He's a fascinating figure. Um, like was mentioned, he was a figure in several French regimes. Um, he was a slippery snake of a man. He, you know, he would frame it as saying, look, I'm always looking out for the best interests of France, and I'll position myself in whatever position I need to be in in order to help the country. More cynically, you could look at that and say, well, he's always looking out for himself. <laughs> he's putting himself in the best position that he can be in, um, regardless of whichever you think. He was clearly a, a brilliant man. He was very intelligent. He knew how to get things done. Um, uh, you know, he knew how to, uh, you know, work behind the scenes, you could say. Um, you know, he was a figure uh, in the revolution, in Napoleon's government, in the government to come. So he's really a fascinating guy, um, but one who was very tricky and probably not to be trusted, though he always managed to snake his way into the halls of power, even though um, I'm sure people knew that he wasn't to be trusted. From Paris, he wrote to the Russian Emperor Alexander at Allied headquarters, informing him that in the capital, support for Napoleon was crumbling and the city's defences had been completely neglected. He urged the Allies to march immediately on Paris, without allowing Napoleon to distract them. Talleyrand's information was confirmed when the Allies intercepted a report from Napoleon's chief of police, General Savary, mm. meant for the Emperor. The treasury, arsenals and powder stores are empty, we are completely at the end of our resources. The population is discouraged and discontented, wishing peace at any price. As Napoleon advanced on Saint-Dizier, the Allies sent General Witzingerode and 10,000 cavalry to harass his army and to screen their own movements. Mm. 
then began their march on Paris. At Fair Champenois. Yeah, that's a very important piece of intel to get, and this is probably the right move. As always, the Allies find the most success whenever they're able to do what they need to do without actually fighting Napoleon. Um, we saw that in the lead up to the Battle of Leipzig, they would fight French forces where they could, but would make a conscious effort to avoid fighting Napoleon. And right here we're seeing, you know, they're just going to advance on Paris um, with an attempt to avoid Napoleon as much as possible, because he is their biggest challenge. If they can step around him, then that's a massive victory for them. As they collided with Marmont and Mortier's corps, advancing to join Napoleon. <clears throat> An entire National Guard division, 5,000 men, was virtually wiped out as the marshals suffered a crushing defeat. Jeez. Napoleon feared that the fall of Paris would be a fatal blow to his regime. His political authority and ability to wage war might not recover. Mm. So when he received news of the Allies' movements, he tore up his plans and ordered a forced march back to Paris, intending to lead its defence in person. Yeah, I mean... He's been forced into it, right? It's a good move on the Allies' part, or the, the Coalition's part, because either they take Paris and avoid Napoleon, or they force him to abandon his plans um, and march back to Paris sort of unprepared. It wasn't what he was expecting to do. So it's a good move from them. Um, and I mean, Napoleon's probably right. He cannot afford for Paris to be conquered. You know, France isn't Russia. He can't continually retreat, destroy villages, and eventually win. Uh, I don't think he can afford to lose his capital city um, with how much military and political power it affords him. But unfortunately, now he's been put into a bad situation um, partially due to that piece of intel provided by Talleyrand, the, uh, the slippery snake. But, you know, clearly serving his own purposes very well. Or, you know, the, the best interests of France, as he might put it. Um, but yeah, Napoleon's been put into a tricky situation now. Napoleon's wife and son were evacuated from the capital, along with most of his ministers. His brother, Joseph, the ex-king of Spain, was in charge of the city's defences, but had done little. Come on, Joseph. Paris was awash with rumours of treachery and defeat. Marmont and Mortier were able to reach Paris before the Allies, adding their troops to the garrison. It now totaled 37,000 men, including some hardened veterans of the Guard but many more young conscripts, mm. while a third were part-time soldiers of the National Guard. The Allies had 120,000 seasoned troops outside the city. Yeah, it, it is not going to be enough to defend the city, particularly if Napoleon himself isn't there. And given the urgency of taking Paris before <laughs> Napoleon could intervene, their elite guards and grenadier divisions would lead the way. Mm. On the 30th of March, they began their assault from the north. Heavy fighting raged throughout the day. The city's defenders fought bravely, inflicting several thousand casualties on the advancing enemy. But defeat was inevitable. That night, to save Paris from destruction, Marshal Marmont agreed to surrender the city, mm. on condition the garrison was permitted to leave with its weapons. At the Hôtel des Invalides, the 71-year-old Marshal Serrouillet oversaw the burning of 1,400 flags and standards captured from France's enemies, as well as Frederick the Great's sword and sash, so they would not fall into Allied hands. Mm. Paris has finally fallen, you know? It managed to stay strong throughout the entire revolution and Napoleonic Wars. Even when France was under threat, 
In the early 1790s, Paris was never taken, uh, though it was um, uh, roiled by uh, internal violence, revolutionary and counter-revolutionary violence. But now, you know, 20 years later, uh, it has fallen. Um, uh, Napoleon couldn't save it. You know, this is definitely a low point. <laughs> Napoleon was just 15 miles from Paris when oh. he was informed of the city's surrender. He sat with his head in his hands for 15 minutes. Yeah, I can imagine. That'd be devastating. Yeah. The, they're just not willing. Like I said, France isn't Russia, you know? They're not gonna burn or allow Paris to burn to the ground. It's just not gonna happen. On the 31st of March, 1814, France's enemies marched into Paris for the first time since the Hundred Years' War. Wow. So not only has Paris, did Paris not fall during the revolution, it hadn't fallen or hadn't been invaded since the Hundred Years' War. Wow. So, uh, quite a streak has just been broken. Uh, like I said, under the watch of Napoleon. So this is a very low point for France. Parisian crowds cheered the three allied monarchs, bringers mm. of peace. Wow. Okay, so I was talking earlier about how you know, I imagine Napoleon's uh, domestic policies were unpopular in these final days of the war. And, you know, I was wondering how exactly the populace would react. And we've gotten some looks at that during this video, how, you know, there wasn't a lot of guerrilla resistance. People just wanted the war to be over. After more than 20 years of fighting, they were just, they were done with the conflict. And they're cheering the uh, coalition as if they're liberators because they're bringing peace clearly at this point um and you know like i said i know that napoleon still maintained popularity even at this point but clearly a lot of people were disillusioned with him and the desire for peace trumped any you know support napoleon still held um the people just want the war to be over that is their immediate concern um, and they take that over anything else. And I think we're kind of seeing that here. Everyone in Paris was suddenly a royalist once more. Ha! Above all, they cheered for Emperor Alexander of Russia, mm. now hailed as Europe's savior. Yeah. Don Cossacks bivouacked on the Champs-Élysées. Allied troops generally behaved well. Well, that's good. 35 miles away, Napoleon was at Fontainebleau with 36,000 men, all of them hungry and exhausted after their 100-mile forced march. Nevertheless, Napoleon began planning an immediate advance on Paris. Mm. But for the first time, he faced unanimous opposition from his ministers and marshals including Ney, Macdonald, Oudinot, and Berthier. Wow. They reminded him of his oath to act for the good of France. He accused them of disloyalty, acting only to save themselves. They told him the war was lost, and he must abdicate in favor of his son, if possible. Yeah, I mean, I can see why Napoleon would be frustrated, and perhaps they were just looking out for themselves, but, you know you can clearly see they have a point. Like was mentioned earlier in the video, regardless of how many stunning victories Napoleon can achieve, um, he's probably not going to win in the end. You know, at this point, the capital's been taken. The coalition just has so many more men. They're probably right that for the good of France, it's probably time to surrender at this point. Um... And yeah, you know the capital is occupied by the coalition now. Um, and that, that will have some interesting knock-on effects. Um, so will the whole Napoleonic Wars um, on all countries involved. I saw that Epic History TV just released 
uh, a video on the Decemberists in Russia, and that in many ways is tied to the Napoleonic Wars. So I mean, I'll definitely uh, react to that video. But um, you know, we're sort of seeing everything come to an end here, and for the first time. Napoleon's popularity is not enough to sustain him. I mean, we've seen he's had massive support throughout his career. I mean, enough to crown himself emperor, uh, and the people were pretty pleased with them. But at this point, it's just not enough. On the 4th of April, Marshal Marmont surrendered his entire corps to the coalition, mm. which was marched over to the enemy lines against the wishes of many of its officers and men. This was a devastating blow to Napoleon, and encouraged the Allies to reject his offer of a conditional abdication in favour of his son. Two days later, he abdicated without conditions. The Allied powers, having proclaimed that the Emperor Napoleon is the only obstacle to the re-establishment of peace in Europe, the Emperor Napoleon, faithful to his oath, declares that he renounces, for himself and his heirs, the thrones of France and Italy, and that there is no personal sacrifice, including his life, that he is not ready to make in the interests of France. Hmm. Napoleon's abdication was formalized by the Treaty of Fontainebleau, by which he was allowed to keep the title of emperor, become sovereign of the small island of Elba, and retain a bodyguard of 400 men. News came too late to prevent Wellington's attack on Toulouse, leading to a costly and pointless battle, with more than 7,000 casualties. That's just what happened back then. Um, I mean, we saw the same thing uh, with uh, Andrew Jackson um, in, I believe it was the Battle of New Orleans in the War of 1812. Sometimes, uh, you know, enemies would sign a peace treaty, but it would not get back to the, you know, the forces fighting before another major battle was fought. Uh, that's sort of an element of the slow communication uh, of this era that we're seeing played out here. The night after his abdication, Napoleon tried to commit suicide wow. using the poison that had been made for him in Russia in case of capture but it had lost its potency, and he survived. I didn't know that about Napoleon. I didn't know he tried to uh, commit suicide once it was over, but, I mean, I can't say I'm totally surprised. Napoleon's a man who has fought, um, you know, for everything that he's gained, and he has just lost all of it. He's lost everything. You know, he's, um, he's not back to square one, but, you know... He no longer has anywhere to go. He, he can't. He must feel like, that's it, I'm done. Um, he's such an ambitious guy, so I'm not necessarily surprised that he tried to commit suicide, but I didn't know that. I really didn't. Two weeks later, Napoleon bade farewell to his old guard at Fontainebleau Palace mm. and began his journey into exile. Hmm. Some regret there. The Napoleonic Wars, which had raged on land and sea for 11 years, seemed finally at an end. The death toll is unknown, but historians estimate that two to three million lives were lost across Europe. Wow. Most soldiers died not in battle, but from disease. As was common during this era. And um, I think into World War I, that was still the case, that the majority of deaths in war came from disease, not from combat. Many thousands were left maimed and disfigured. Yeah. For most of this period, Napoleon was master of Europe imposing treaties on humbled enemies, redrawing frontiers, overthrowing old regimes, and making new kings. He was the last figure in history to combine total political power 
with frontline military genius. Mm. In the mold of Alexander and Caesar. Yeah. But it seemed Napoleon's reign was to end in abject military defeat. However, exile on Elba did not prove to Napoleon's taste. <laughs> in less than 10 months, he would return to France to fight one last great campaign to reclaim his throne. Alrighty, well that was a fantastic video. Um, we've got one more in this series and then we've got Napoleon's Marshals, though the remaining video, Waterloo, I think is a pretty short one. Um, I will be reacting to that, of course. Um, and they're exactly right. I mean, Napoleon was, I think, the last major figure to combine those qualities. I mean, of course, there were uh, men after Napoleon who would greatly reshape Europe militarily and politically, but none combined his complete political control um, with his military brilliance, frontline military brilliance, partially because, um, you know, we get into the 20th century and, and most of our great... Um, political figures, leaders, um, you know, great sovereigns would not lead on the front lines. Um, but yeah, that's exactly right. Uh, that was a great video. Um, you know, I'm excited to uh, watch the final video. I'm a little sad the series is over, but it was a great one. Um, you know, uh, I've got some suggestions for further videos on the uh, Battle of Waterloo to react to, so I'll check those out. Um, like I mentioned, I saw that Epic History TV had released a video on the Decembrists in Russia, so I'm going to be watching that. Um, there will be plenty more videos to come in the future. Um, uh, you know, the reaction to the Battle of Waterloo, and then this series will be over, and then Napoleon's Marshals. Um, so yeah, I hope you guys enjoyed this one. If you did, please leave a like, subscribe to the Patreon, uh, subscribe to the channel, uh, and I hope you tune in for the next reaction. I hope y'all are having a good day today, and I will see you all again next time. Goodbye.